Morning everybody, welcome to the latest AHDB webinar from the East Midlands and from Northampton Monitor Farm. For this session, AHDB is in partnership with Anglian Water and uh, they're jointly funding the soil health review that uh, will be the focus of today's webinar. Um, I'm Judith Stafford, I'm the uh, Knowledge Exchange Manager for the East Midlands and we've, we've got with us our monitor farmer for Northampton, monitor farm, that's Rick Davis. We're also joined by Elizabeth Stockdale, head of farming systems at uh, Half Farming Systems Research at NIAB, and Georgina Wallace, catchment sensitive, uh, uh, catchment advisor, sorry, I'm getting rolled up, at uh, Anglian Water. Uh, welcome to all of you. It's going to be Georgina who starts things off in a, a few minutes with a brief update about where Anglian water fits in and the link between soil health and water quality. Then Rick and Elizabeth will be taking us on the virtual tour of Rick's farm and uh, talking us through the findings and uh, implications of the soil health review. Before we do that, there was always uh, just a few bits of housekeeping to do. Um, I should mention in the background, you saw that appear, that wasn't me, that was my colleague Christian who's controlling things for, um, from Yorkshire. Christian's based at the York office, working from, from home today. So thanks Christian. Um, that's a reminder that um, you're all muted. Uh, so uh, I can neither see nor hear you, none of us can. Um, next one, any questions? If you have questions, can you put them in the box that you'll see on the right hand side? There's a, a, a little place for chat. That's for technical issues and any other questions as well. Um, and, and what we'll do, most, most of the questions will be saved until the end, but it might be an opportunity to slip one or two in before that. That's a reminder that the webinar is scheduled to finish around about 10 o'clock. It might just run over very slightly, but it's somewhere around then. Um, basis and the ROSO points. There's one available for each, each uh, of those. Um, we need your details for that, so can you enter them in the chat box, please, if you haven't done that already. Make sure that we've got them in order for you to claim your points. The meeting's going to be recorded. You'll be able to watch it afterwards. You should be sent a link for that if you've registered. That's a reminder of um, our social media handle and, and so on. And also it's a reminder for me just to mention, if you don't receive emails from us but would like to, can you please make sure that you fill in a contact form and that you've given permission for us to use your email address, very important. I'll try and remind you about that at the end and my contact details will be there. So if you can't find the contact details on the website, um, you can uh, ask me and I can hopefully uh, direct you to it. So um, I think, uh, we're, we're ready to move on to Georgina. Uh, over to you, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name's Georgina Wallace. I'm a catchment advisor at Anglian Water. I cover the um, Bedfordshire and Northamptonshire areas. Um, thank you very much for coming on the call this morning. I'm going to do a quick sort of background as to why Anglian Water is working with AHDB on soils and a bit of an update on water quality locally. Um, I'm a farmer's daughter locally to this area, so quite lucky that I've got a, a good background in the local region and um, know a fair few of the farmers, which is great. Next slide, please, Christian. So the aims of catchment management, um, it's a really flexible approach to working with local farmers, um, trying to support and improve the environment. Um, we want to improve sustainability of water sources, so that means um, quantity and quality of, of potable water, um, reduce water treatment costs, um, every pesticide and um, impurity that gets into water needs to be treated, which obviously costs um, money, and retention of pesticide actives. Um, over the last couple of years we've lost quite a lot of actives and um, it's something we want to try and avoid by working with you um, directly to sort of create a sustainable agricultural industry. Next slide, please. Just to give a little bit of context, um, we're down in sort of the, the southwest here of the Anglian Water region, or it's where we're talking about today. Um, but really just wanted to flag that there is a water source near you. Um, might not always feel like it, but um, 
certainly there's there's plenty of streams, rivers and abstraction points round and about which can be heavily influenced by our farming practices. Next slide please. There's lots of other strains on the system as well and I just wanted to flag that. Um, one of the things that I try to implement with my work is, is to highlight that we're not bashing farmers over the head, we're not trying to, to um, you know, put anybody in the wrong, um, but actually there's so much going on in our region. It's the breadbasket of the country in terms of um, cereal production and lots of other things going on as well. It's a, a growing population and a very dry region. So actually balancing um, demand for water is, is something that's highly important to us. Next slide, please. I wanted to highlight as well how awful the weather's been. Um, the last two years has been fairly chaotic, hasn't it, in terms of getting crops established in the autumn. Um, we've had significant sort of drought periods and then very heavy rain. Um, we've had the wettest October on record, um, the third wettest month ever, and October the 3rd was actually um, the wettest day and enough to fill Loch Ness. Um, so we've had a significant amount of rain again, and um, it's just appreciating that really. It's not been easy for, for anybody. Next slide, please. So what did we do? Um, we have made an effort to get out there within the catchment and work with, with farmers directly. So um, you might well have heard of Slug It Out, which is um, a scheme which has paid farmers the, the cost difference between metaldehyde and ferric phosphate. We've done that in specific um, catchments around reservoirs, um, seven different advisors and eight catchments, um, working with a, a huge number of farmers to, to try to manage the active, which, which actually we did very successfully. Um, next slide, please. We had 100% uptake of the scheme and an overall 94% reduction in metaldehyde levels, which showed that we could control metaldehyde around the drinking water reservoirs very successfully. Um, we actually also had um, 13,500 voluntary hectares put into the scheme as well, where fields um, of certain farms fell out of the catchment. Next slide, please. So healthy soils, why are we, why are we interested in soils? Um, next slide, please. Our soils um, have got the opportunity to keep pesticides and, and obviously soils themselves where they should be. Um, we need to try to build them up to be as resilient as we can be for the future, um, acting as a, a giant sponge really to soak up pesticides and um, nutrients and keep them in the fields where we want them to be. Essentially, um, they're not cheap. Um, if we can keep them on the fields and not lose them um, into the, the rivers and reservoirs, then we're not having to, to treat them. And all round, it's a much happier picture. Um, in the process of that, we do need to optimise food production. Um, we appreciate that there is a, a hugely growing population demand for food, and we need to work with farmers to build business resilience um, and do that in a practical way. Next slide, please. Some of the stuff we've done um, historically, we have um, up in Lincolnshire looked at um, cover crops and the success of, of them, um, different mixes, different um, varieties grown. And um, this graph shows you that the nitrate leaching, so nutrient loss from that field, reduces significantly um, when there is more cover in place. Um, not necessarily the most premium of mixes, but some cover um, has introduced a huge amount of um, reduction in losses from that field. Next slide, please. Just very quickly wanted to touch on metaldehyde levels. Um, it's been a very wet October, as, as I've mentioned. We have seen pretty high metaldehyde levels within the ooze catchment, which we are discussing today. Um, the 0.1 red line there is the regulatory limit. Um, and you can see um, sort of since the middle of October onwards, we've we've been above that fairly consistently. Um, for example, we've got um, a, a couple of lines here that are actually upstream of the, um, the farm that we're talking about today. And <coughs> the levels have got particularly high there up to sort of 0.5, um, which is, is very high. Um, trouble with metaldehyde is it's very difficult to treat. 
Um, so once it's in the water, we must rely on sort of a, a range of blending or um, turning off of abstractions to miss these peaks, um, which all um, isn't cheap. Next slide, please. Also, um, very quickly, wanted to touch on um, propizomide. We have seen a little bit of propizomide come through already um, this season, but this graph, a little bit more complicated. Um, you can see the 0.1 um, limit going horizontally across <laughs> the graph um, and vertically shows the cutoff date of the back end of, of January and just wanted to demonstrate how long it actually sticks around in the system. So we've just got to be particularly careful with this herbicide to make sure um, that we're using it as, as carefully as we possibly can be. Next slide, please. Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, if anybody is, is interested locally in having a chat, I would absolutely love to hear from you, um, particularly on soils. Um, hopefully, once we come out of this lockdown, we'll be able to come out on farm and have a bit more of a chat with you on a one-to-one -one basis about soils and, and how we can help you going forwards. Thank you. Thank you, Georgina. We haven't had any questions come through at this stage. I'd just like to comment on your um, Loch Ness comment. It does just put things into context when you compare it like that. It's a lot of water. It's very deep, apparently. Um, well, uh, you are going to come back briefly at the end and just, just to give you contact details and so on. But, but for now, we're going to move on into the um, virtual tour with uh, Liz and Rick. And to start things off, we're going to do a poll with one question. And that is, this is for, for audience participation, if that, that's not clear. Uh, we want to ask you, why does soil health matter on your farm? Can you choose just one of the following? Productivity or resilience or minimizing environmental impact? I imagine some people will be probably scratching their heads. I'll give you a few seconds to answer that. Just click one. And um, from productivity, resilience, or minimizing environmental impact. Well, that's what we've come out with so far. Thank you very much. I think that uh, I'll, I'll hand over to Liz at that point and she will pick up from there. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. So I lead the AHDB BBRO funded Soil Biology and Soil Health Partnership. And Next slide, please. One of the things we've been doing is bringing together the information that exists to try and draw together those key principles that might underpin soil health. Alongside that, we've also been working to, to bring together measurements that give people hopefully a robust sort of approach to measuring these things on farm. So just to set our scene, it's important to recognise that soil health is about the combination of chemistry, physics and biology on farm, about managing those soil properties appropriately. I've got someone at the door, at the Labrador, loving to tell me that that's true. Um, so we've got a need here to get the foundations right, the chemistry and the physics of the soil, set the foundations for that biology to be expressed appropriately. Um, we're not going to dwell today particularly on these man different management approaches, but the key here really is about putting them all into practice as effectively as possible on farm. So that's about getting the chemistry right, the nutrients and the pH, about understanding and managing the texture, and then about supplying and enhancing the biology. Next slide, please. So we've been focusing on developing that scorecard approach that takes a GP's approach to capturing measurements of chemistry, physics and biology and looking at them together. So that means some on farm in field work, not just collecting samples to send away for analysis, but also to use the spade to understand and describe the structure of the soil. But here, I think it's important to just to note, this isn't about taking data we have already, though we do have some of this data already on farm. It's particularly around linking those data together. So it's about collecting all that data in one place at one time and ideally knowing where on the farm that's collected so we can go back to those places and look at the evolution or the changes in those properties over a rotational time scale. Next slide please. So that's what we did with Rick at the Northampton Monitor Farm. Spade, 
dug holes, this isn't actually one of Rick's pictures, looking for the soil structure and describing that dominantly through pictures, but also using the visual assessment of soil structure approach um, already funded um, through the grassland part of AHDB, um, pioneered by SRUC in Scotland to give a score to that qualitative assessment. And, and the work done there clearly shows that farmers are just as good with reference points um, at giving the appropriate scores for soil structure. And at the same time, taking that block of soil that we dug and counting the worms. So we're bringing those things together as well as that capturing of chemistry. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Uh, good morning, all. One minute, please. Sorry, I've just just reduced the screen. Um, so, good morning, all. Um, thank you for that, Liz. Um, just thought I would run through of a quick farm update. Um, where we are currently. Um, firstly, thank you to Georgina from Anglian Water for, um, for partly funding this with the HDB. Um, I've learned a huge amount through uh, through doing this with, with Liz and Georgina. Um, and also thanks to Liz for, for coming out and doing the, the uh, field scale assessments, etc. cetera. Um, again, as we all know, it's been a, another tricky autumn. Um, a lot of people said we can't have two years the same. Well, evidently we can. Um, I think for us, uh, we have probably had a wetter autumn this year than than 2019. Um, and as and as the rainfall figures there show, 140 mil in October and five dry days um, doesn't necessarily mean that they were days that we could go drilling. Um, and October 19, nine dry days. Um, so as a result of that, this year I did start drilling almost three weeks earlier than 2019, and it took me another week to finish so um it's not been the most enjoyable of seasons again but anyway we are we are 100 percent drilled up what i wanted to drill um 90 to 95 percent i'm happy with there's a few wet headlands or waterlogged areas or places where we've had significant water damage or pre-em damage but in the main i'm very pleased um so again on the back of on the back of the uh the three crop, the three crop rule being uh, being abandoned. Uh, we have put some more wheat in the ground this year, probably like every other farm in the country. Um, spring bean area is about the same, and we've dropped spring barley for this year. Not saying we will do going forward, because it's very good for black grass control, but in light of Brexit and the uncertainty on export markets, etc., I thought it's probably the best thing to do. Um, Slugs this year have caught me out slightly uh, with no rape in the rotation for more than uh, two, almost three years. Um, and we've had very, very low pressure for the last couple of years. Uh, I've had a few a few patches here and there, which um, I wasn't anticipating high slug pressure. Um, but again, it just goes to show you can't be complacent and you can't, uh, can't take your eye off the ball. I uh, also had some... Uh, Drill demos, um, had a horse sprinter on demo in August, which I planted some cover crops with. And then uh, a neighbor came and drilled some uh, some wheat in the last few days of September um, alongside the Clayton and um, been really interesting. But again, once again, the Clayton's really proved its worth um, and I, I really can't fault it. Next slide, please. So this is, I've just got a, got a couple of photos which show the extremes of this season. So this is um, this is Crusoe um, drilled on the 27th of September on heavy land after beans, and I'm absolutely chuffed to bits. Next slide, please. And then this is the other extreme. So um, this is some wheat drilled down, uh, admittedly on the floodplain, which has been continuous spring barley for I think five years. Drilled on the 21st of September. Um, and within 10 days, it uh, we had about 70 acres underwater. So uh, not ideal. The majority of it has survived. It was waterlogged for, I think, six days. Um, but where there was a bit of flowing water, it's washed, it's washed a lot of the soil out and um, and the crop has, has failed. Um, subsequently, we re redrilled it and we had another flood last weekend. So, um, yeah, challenging. 
testing. Uh, and I'm sure that Georgina will have something to say about this cropping on a floodplain. Um, and I think something going forward that we probably have to address uh, and and do something different. We've already taken out about 50% of our floodplain and now is into permanent back into permanent pasture. Next slide, please. Um, so this I originally put down just 2020 yields, but I thought it doesn't really show it in context of our eight-year average. Um, so you can see this year first wheat which we had a relatively small area of um, was after beans um, very pleasing with some next days uh, and it's first year on the farm um, second wheat that encompasses second third fourth fifth wheats um, and again despite the year despite the couple of the first fields we combined at sort of between five and a half and six tons a hectare I'm pretty pleased with that result um, but as again, you can see that from our from our eight-year average, we're we're about 30% down on average, a combination of first and second week. Uh, spring barley had a bit of a poor year again. Um, looked fairly well at times, but again, the seven weeks without rain was just too much. Um, finishing up at the end, 4.8 tons a hectare, which again we had a range within that from I think three tons up to seven. So. Um, and then finally spring beans we've averaged 3.6 which again in the on the year i'm pretty pleased with uh, they're quite a small bean in the end on the sample and fairly high broker damage but um all in all we've been a lot better than some and um i can't complain next slide please just before you move on rick <clears throat> i've had a question that says um is is and it's probably a good time to answer it somebody wondering is this a mixed farm or purely arable could you answer that briefly please Sorry, yes. Um, so we are predominantly arable um, with 400 hectares all in of arable effectively. Um, and then I have a small herd of red pole cattle um, in number about 20 to 25. So I would say predominantly arable with a small, small cattle herd. Um, and again, I, I do use the make, make compost from the, uh, from the muck, etc. But they don't rotate within the arable rotation. OK, thanks. Um, so here is effectively the start of our virtual farm tour, um, which I think myself and Liz will sort of chip in as as we go. But again, feel free to ask questions as we go on a field by field basis. Um, so this field is tight so close, which is only a four hectare field, sort of up in the back of our, our local village, Clifton Rains. Um, the reason I chose this one was because it's uh, it's it's an overachieving field. It's been producing some significantly high yields than it ever should do for a number of years. Um, it is it is primarily very heavy clay, uh, sort of overlying, overlying limestone rock, and at times it is unworkable. Um, we haven't ploughed this field now for probably, I think, seven or eight years. I don't ever intend on ploughing it again. Um, this year was drilled on the 21st of September. Again, I tried to get some of our more difficult soils in early, so I didn't get in the same position as last year. Um, and again, from cultivations, you can see all it's had is a terra star after harvest, chopped straw, terra star, and then straight from the clay and drill, and then one roll. Um, so current crop is group one Crusoe, uh, and this is a, I think it's a third wheat. Uh, next slide, please. So this photo was taken last Friday. Um, so again, it's sort of five to six weeks after emergence. Um, really pleased with the establishment here on, on the heavy bit of the field. And you can see towards the hedge, it's, 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 sat, um, it's sat quite wet, uh, a little bit yellow on the top there. Um, again, it's a field that we can't really subsoil or mole plough because the bedrock is 12 to 12 inches deep, sorry, 12 inches down from the surface. So it's, um, I think it partly is a reason why it's, it um, it achieves so well because it does keep hold of the moisture throughout the summer. Uh, next slide, please. Which is mine, I believe. So you're going to see a few of these. So with this first one, I'm just going to actually talk about what you can see and what we measured, and then I'll talk about the data. So 
but as I said, we do that combination of, of digging a hole and describing the physical structure. So on the scorecard there, we've got the structure score, the visual assessment, the VES score. But at the same time, we also make sure we take a picture of that block of soil because the block of the picture is much better than any sort of uh, words I might write down about it. Uh, from those blocks, we're also counting the earthworms. Now, Rick will be very keen to point out that that earthworm number is not the total number of earthworms that we found, but the number of adults in that spade block, a 20 by 20 by 25 uh, deep block. Um, in all of the pits that you see, there were also a significant number of juvenile earthworms, but the indicator as it currently sits, um, currently under review, is, um, is for the number of adults um, seen. And then if we start from then from the top in the scorecard itself, we've got pH, P, K, P, K and MG. Those are the standard measures I think that most of you will be used to if you're sending soils away for analysis. And so those are included here. The colouring in, the, the traffic lighting for those is exactly as you would expect by soil texture and um, using the guides in RB209. So um, for example, index 2P would be coloured in green. Whereas if we were at index zero, we go red, index one is amber. And actually with phosphorus and only with phosphorus in terms of the nutrients, as we go above the top, so if we go up into index five, that would start to flag amber again as a, as a warning risk. Um, if, for, if sediment or soil was to leave the field, a risk to the environment. It's a, it's a key trigger there for just thinking a bit more carefully about perhaps phosphorus management in, on those sites and potentially also perhaps organic matter management in terms of use of manures if, if those are available on farm. You can see here the site is not strictly calcareous, that clay cap isn't um, bringing through significant amounts of the limestone, but we've got a fairly high pH. So the calcium there that is feeding through the soil, um, through soil forming processes, keeping this soil at um, a, a good level pH. And interestingly, 7.5 is the level, and hence this has gone amber, at which pH triggers to just flag to Rick or to whoever's using the land that that might be an area where actually nutrient availability, in this case particularly phosphorus, might be affected. Um, by that higher pH, the higher calcium level in the soil particularly, but magnesium too, can help to lock up um, phosphorus, make it less available. Further down the scorecard, uh, soil organic matter, here measured by loss on ignition. There are a number of ways of measuring the amount of organic matter in soils, either as carbon or as organic matter. They can all be expressed as organic matter in this way. And the benchmarking we're currently doing takes account of soil texture, and also the local climate. So we would expect higher levels of organic matter in the north of Scotland than in Northamptonshire, simply because of the climate even on soils of the same texture. And so the, the benchmarking um, takes those into account. Then we've got two measures of biological activity. At the moment in the project, we're assessing and looking at these. Um, we know they're reliable measures. We can take samples and they can be measured in the laboratory reliably time after time. Um, but Actually, the question is how we interpret that data, how we create the traffic lights that help us understand whether we're at good or average or poor levels. And that work is currently ongoing so that we're using here the traffic lights that have been developed for both of those measures um, as they currently sit within the soil biology and soil health project. It may be that in a year's time when we're tidying up and finishing and evaluating across all the sites we've measured, those boundaries change a little bit. But nonetheless, as measurements, they're quite robust measurements of biological activity in the soil. They're telling us about the potential so that they take out the, the effect of the immediately varying moisture conditions. So they give us a, a measurement of the sort of quality of microbial activity or its potential on that sort of rotational level. Um, and so what we have here is a scorecard that's a little bit like a GP soil health check. It's not doing anything in detail. It's deliberately using measures that are robust, fairly easy to measure and not too costly, but that give us a quick look at whether the soil is or isn't behaving as we might expect it to. So on this heavy clay to clay loam soil, you see the percentages there of clay and sand, and you'll see that on each of the fields we look at. Um, I think one of the things, the standout thing here is actually the quality of the structure. So on a soil that is heavy clay soil, actually what we have here is a very good crumb structure in the top, um, what will have been in the past plough layer. 
Um, and but the so subsoil, and you can see it at the bottom of the spade, just below the point the speech bubble emerges is heavy and dense it's a really difficult subsoil and so here as Rick would have told you without me having to dig any holes clearly timeliness is going to be a real key to maintaining soil health but it's important here and one of the reasons we're getting that good structure in the context of a, a soil that's managed well um, in terms of its timeliness is that the calcium and magnesium levels are both good on this soil and that means that those aggregates that those forms those small rounded blocks and crumbs are, have a re resistant structure one that can bear some degree of um, raindrop impact and even uh, trafficking without complete disintegration that doesn't mean that timeliness isn't important on these soils timeliness is critical but where timeliness is good the biology and the clay mineral structure will work together to give us this really good um, structure the key is maintaining it in, and enhancing it and here that high organic matter level 9.9 .9 is not just good for these soils but at the very at the top end of, of what, what we might expect um, 7.7 .7 would be a sort of standard for soils of this type of this texture so here with this very good organic matter is also helping to support and enhance the turnover of organic matter which is helping to also maintain that aggregate stability so a bit longer on this one than we will spend on any of the other scorecards but just to give you a bit of an introduction and i guess here exactly as we expect good levels of everything that we might expect Rick's a bit disappointed about his earthworms. He'll continue to say that about every slide we look at. Next slide. Please. Question, please. Don't go, don't do it, move on. Um, sorry. But I think we need to answer this now, really, because somebody's asking um, about it looks a healthy soil, which indeed it does, but the earthworm count's low, as you've just mentioned. And um, this question wants to know what time of year the test was taken. I think that's a fairly quick one. Yeah, so we were sampling as the soils wetted up um, after this, in, in this field, after this crop had been drilled, I'm going to struggle with the date, but it was round about the 14th, I think, of October this year. Yes. Yeah, and um, there, another quickie as well, I hope. Um, somebody uh, has asked how the um, soil, orga uh, soil organic matter was calculated, and uh, you will have been expecting this. What does PMN mean? Um, so soil organic matter here, we these measurements are made with loss on ignition. Um, I will comment on that when we look at all the data at the end, um, because there's one thing we just need to bear in mind in that context. There are a number of ways of measuring um, and then calculating soil organic matter. They're all actually fairly robust. The key is that if we're going to benchmark, we'll go back and look at this site time and time again, when we compare measurements, they should be made in the same way. But I think that's that's important. Um, yeah, low earthworm numbers, I think you will have noticed, and Rick has told us already, but you would have particularly noticed here, this field's had a fairly dull diet of crops over the last few years. Um, that won't. That's one of those things in terms of biology that probably isn't helping the numbers of earthworms. But in general, the numbers of juveniles are also pretty good. So this is only just um, it, it, it's it's red. It, it's pushing amber on a soil that sits wet like this one does. I don't think we should necessarily be surprised. The other biological measures. So you asked what PMN was. Um, the other biological measures, both CO2 burst and PMN, so both measures of potential biological activity. So we basically poke the soil and see how much it breathes. That's the CO2 burst. Or we poke the soil and see how much nitrogen is produced by biological activity. So that's potentially mineralizable nitrogen. We use the nitrogen cycling to tell us the same sort of indicator. At the moment, we're looking at both in parallel. Thanks. We'd uh, better walk a bit faster. We've got six fields left. I, th I think we might overrun almost certainly, but um, but it's uh, please carry on. Next slide, please. Yeah, thanks, Liz. Um, yeah, just to reiterate the point on that field, just just quickly. Um, yeah, unfortunately, it's nothing. Probably nothing to do with my my uh, my management of that field. That field has been uh, closed historically. Has been close to the old farmyard uh, in the village and would have had. FYM for probably 40, 50, 100 years, etc. So it's, it's as a result is inherently fertile, and as a result does achieve some very good yields. 
Um, just moving on quickly. Um, so this is Lavender Meadow um, second field, which again, rape was the last break crop in 2017, I believe, or 2016. Um, and it's subsequently been three weeks since then. Um, this is a cover crop I planted in about 20th of August. Um, it's basically spring barley and some peas, I'm trying to see if we can try and grow some cover crops very cheaply. Um, and it grew some really good biomass. This was taken, uh, like Liz said, around about 14th of October, this picture. Um, the only cultivations were horse sprinter and then obviously drilled with the Claydon drill, no rolling because it was too wet. Um, next slide, please. So this photo was taken on the 14th of, no, 14th of November, last Friday, which I think was the uh, 19th of November. Um, so the crop had emerged about seven days previous. As you can see, the cover crop has rotted down, um, locked up some nitrogen in the meantime, and um, it's actually, it's actually uh, worked really well, really pleased with the outcome. A uh, little bit concerned about drilling of the Claydon drill into a pretty thick green cover crop, but um, in the main, it's gone gone well. Next slide, please. So and this was me digging a hole. Um, so you can see here very different texture. Um, still quite high clay content, so we're still medium, quite strong soil, but now with 43% sand, um, and, and you can almost see some of the sand grains in there. Stip, this is um, Rick chose as an example of one of his well-performing but more typical um, fields. Very good levels across. You can see now here the earthworm numbers really in responding to the presence of the cover crop, and it was obvious that those earthworm activity was a dominantly around the roots of the growing cover crop. Really good evidence on this soil of good crumbs and subangular blocky structures throughout, so a score of two. Again, quite a high calcium level here, good pH, um, naturally very slightly calcareous. So we've got that maintained aggregate stability, but I suspect, and it wasn't when I dug it, but I suspect it is still quite a sticky soil when it's wet. Yes, it is. <laughs> Next slide, please. So uh, it's third field. Um, I chose this field uh, effectively. Uh, it's been in continuous grass uh, for around 20 years. It used to be an ex arable field, um, but again, it's seven acres with 13 corners um, adjacent to a village. And then we, we decided to take it out purely from the point of view that it was just, it was just a bit too small and hard to access. So uh, current crop of horses, which have been there for 20 odd years. Um, and it's taken this field from probably one of our, one of our best little fields on the farm to I'd say one of our poorest in a very short space of time. Um, effectively, as I see it, I wanted to look at this field because as, um, as a lot of horse folk do, they remove the poo daily, weekly, etc. So they're basically mining nutrition and then exporting it and taking it off the field to reduce their worm, uh, worm population in, 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 the, in the horse's gut. So effectively, this field has been mined of, of any nutrition over the last 20 years. And in, in essence, it will hardly grow a crop of hay or anything. So I wanted to look at this field because it's, a, again, it's a fairly similar um, soil type overlying um, limestone in places. It, it's got some light areas, it's got some heavy areas. Um, and I wanted to see how this compared to uh, two other fields on the farm. So Lavender Meadow, we've just seen we're going to compare it to the next field after this one. So they're very similar soil types, uh, very close proximity to each other, but again, very different management. Next slide, please. So you can see here the very distinct and different um, soils under grass. Perhaps we could argue that top held together much more strongly with the rooting and a little bit of thatch on the surface here. I think the thing that stands out straight away, and you'll all be looking at those, what stands out red straight away, is, is the, the way in which the nutrients, particularly phosphorus on this soil, have been mined under that management um, strategy that Rick's just described to us. We notice that K holds good, and that is because of the natural capacity of these soils, this soil type to supply K. So in general, these medium soils are able to, to naturally maintain and supply good levels of K. Um, magnesium and phosphorus both being de um, depleted here. Um, 
Soil organic matter, though, at very good levels, not surprising under grass. And actually, the benchmarks are slightly different under grass, as we'd expect more organic matters being returned, a longer cycle of photosynthesis, more roots. And so we have a higher benchmark for soil organic matter. But we can see, too, going with that higher organic matter, supporting that higher potential for biological activity. Now, the worm numbers here, this soil actually on October the 14th, despite the fact it started raining very hard at the beginning of October, was still quite dry. In fact, very dry, very crumbly at the bottom. And that's partly because the thatch on these grass soils plus the active growing grass still during October is maintaining those soils to be quite slow to re-wet to the surface. And that would have been hampering um, the worm activity. So good rooting, but stony in the bottom. I think the standout for this soil is, is exactly why we looked at it, to see the, the impact of the, on the indices of that um, continued exploitative management under grass. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, again, like I said, this is a uh, lodge field, which again is probably within 500 metres of the previous field. Um, this is a awkward corner of a, uh, what was an arable field. Um, so this, this corner in line with the trees effectively and, and, and behind the, the, the shot of the photo, probably about half an acre of permanent grass. It's been grassed for about 20 years. The field, the adjoining field to the right, we grassed down last October for the Bucks Young Farmers Country Show, which again, due to COVID, was cancelled. Um, the plan was to put this field in probably for four, four to five years to bring up the organic matter on some really light ground and um, and go from there. But as as it's actually achieved three pretty pretty good uh, silage crops this year, uh, which we've exported and sold to a local dairy farm, I'm really pleased with how it's actually performed given this season, given the light land, the nature of the light land and actually the lack of rainfall. But the grass growth was very quick when we had rain, obviously. Um, but at certain times of the summer, it was actually it completely burnt off. Um, so I just wanted to bring this one in, as, like I said, is again to bring the three fields together: together lavender meadow, cottage field, and lodge field. All very similar soil types, all very different management, and to try and assess where and how they differ, and and also to look at the organic matter because sometimes we always get very hung up on organic matter content, and uh, a lot of people seem to make that their primary focus and I wanted to sort of look at these fields to try and reiterate the point that it's not just about organic matter. Next slide please. So again we've got that uh, strong rooting holding the, the um, soil together in the surface but that crumbles really easily and breaks apart so there's no evidence of um, compaction in here at all and surprisingly barely trafficked um, ground. Um, a huge range of biological activity. Um, Georgie, Georgina was helping me with this one and um, did get savaged by some ants that thought she was marvellous as um, fodder while breaking open a block of um, soil. There was some thatch and that's that picture to the right there. So often we associate thatch with um, poor pH soils. Actually that isn't always the case here, just the um, continued cutting under permanent pasture conditions with certain grass types can lead to a, lead to a very thatchy surface which can limit water ingress and, and can be an issue if we're trying to in this context maintain um, pasture for silage. I mean this bit is the, the permanent bit rather than the, the newer silage ground. Notice here medium texture so still pretty good clay content um, but again slightly higher sand so this isn't a light soil by any means but at close to 50 percent sand without taking any outputs off this so the this this particular bit of the field 20 years with no removals we've got very good indices but i think you might be interested i think it's a, it's a measure of of the fact that this soil was dry that we're surrounding relatively few adult earthworms that we did see deep burrowing earthworms but but fewer than we might expect under under a grass system next slide please Thank you, Liz. Uh, yeah, on to our fourth field, um, fifth field, home field. Um, so again, this is a primary soil, soil type for the large part of the, the top end of our home farm. So it's, it's again, it's sand and gravel over over limestone. Um, again, we haven't um, we haven't used the plough for I think five years. Um, 
I wasn't intending on using the plough in this field either really this year, but we've had some underlying issues which probably brought on by myself making some homemade compost two years ago. Um, my brother has a turf business on the farm and effectively we have a bit of a an old turf dump where he's got any any damaged rolls or any any rolls that might have um, heated up in the process of transport so probably in two years ago i made made some compost out of um uh cattle muck uh horse muck wood chippings and some waste turf made some lovely stuff really pleased really quite excited about it spread it on 25 hectares of of light ground expecting some some results straight away and and on this field particularly uh, we've had very high numbers of, of sort of parasites and nematodes which we haven't exactly proven is whether they're beneficial or not but I'm pretty certain it had a significant effect on last year's um, wheat crop which obviously in a dry year uh, it had a combination of everything thrown at it, it had um, manganese deficiency because it was so wet we couldn't get on the spray, turnip yellow virus, take all because it was a second wheat, uh, compounded with the fact that we'd had put this compost on and had um, some nematodes eating some of the roots as well. So as a result, I, and also, sorry, we had some weed, so as a result of the, of the thin crop, we had some groundsel and hedge mustard in there. So I thought we will start again, start afresh. So we ploughed it down and ploughed beautifully in, in August, really dry. Uh, so you can see from the cultivations, plough, SKH crumbler, and then straight in with a laden drill in the middle of October on a in a dry weather window. Uh, current crop again is Zayat winter wheat. Uh, next slide, please. And this was taken again last Friday. Um, you can see in between the rows there, you can see the gravel that sort of washed out in effect. Um, so again, drill with a laden drill. Uh, slightly deeper than I would have liked because it's very hard to keep the clay now on soft soft going. Um, but in the main, established really well. Next slide, please. So I think you can see from the photograph um, the distinct sandiness of this soil. This is a real light soil now with only 15% clay and up towards that 70% sand. Not calcareous, but still a good pH. So we're seeing that underlying limestone feeding through. But we're also seeing in the nutrient indices, the first one and the only one of the soils I looked at where potassium is an issue. And that's because on these light soils, it's really quite tricky to hold on to those cations effectively. Um, and so here, actually, it is, it is possible that, that potassium is an issue and, and we might need to be thinking about managing potassium differently on this really light soil in comparison to um, the, the woes with slightly more body, treating potassium in that context a bit more like nitrogen in terms of meeting plant need rather than managing it rotationally. Um, relatively low organic matter number compared to what we have seen on other fields, but actually for a sandy soil, that's just into the green. It's, it's not a bad level for the soil because the same problem occurs for maintaining and stabilizing organic matter as holding on to cations. Those sands just don't have a big surface area, don't have a very big active surface area, and that makes it difficult for the material to be uh, the, to be stabilised. I think perhaps the most interesting thing in terms of biological activity here is not the worms, but actually a difference in the um, between the numbers we get for PMN and CO2 burst. So here the CO2 burst is still up, it's not the bottom by any means of the ones we measured, whereas the nitrogen cycling in indicator is, is actually the lowest of the fields we measured. So we've got some mix up here, some change in the way that the carbon, the breathing of the microbes and their cycling of nitrogen is going on. And that might be um, a response to that um, compost addition. There might be a number of things going on. It's really tricky to pick that out. So this GP's test pull, pulls that out perhaps as something to look at, though it's showing as green. It's the kind of thing I notice. Um, but not necessarily as something that we can solve here. We'd have to do more detailed look. And we can see, we saw as we dug the hole, this trash layer resulting from ploughing. Good crumb, crumb structure, but the key issue on this soil is that that low cation exchange capacity, that low active surface area means we can't hold on to our 
uh, potassiums, magnesiums or calcium, as well as the medium soils on the farm. So they will behave differently in terms of their resilience, their ability to hold on to nutrition. Next slide, please. Just quickly, Liz, on, on that slide, yeah. PMN and CO2 burst, would you think they'd be affected by the plough? By effectively burying that trash at depth? Um, but what we're looking at is a, is a potential across the profile. There will be, if we were looking at it zonally, yes. So I think you will see, you'll see stop, you'll see a difference in the way it's the the things happen by depth as a result of your reset. But you, what you've created is a, is a mixed top layer. I don't, in terms of, of mixing that compost in to deal with it, to get some biological ha activity happening throughout the profile to deal with it for you, I don't think it's a bad reset. I think it's a tricky year to have done it in because you create, as you as we walked across it, we know we created that soft seed bed that was just acting as a marvellous sponge and making it really difficult to dry on. Yes, it wasn't It wasn't my intended consequence. I, I really didn't want to plough it, but um, the ground was in such good order before. It was such a shame to mix all that um, lovely, friable organic yeah, matter. I think, in the, the, I think yeah. the evidence is that occasional ploughing isn't a disaster it's as you say it's something that needs to be done with care and consideration but the evidence in terms of biological activity organic matter levels other things there's been some scientific studies done to have a look at that in some detail and occasional plowing doesn't isn't a complete disaster it's not a go back to start to right back to the start of a, of a process of adopting uh, reduced or no tillage systems and sometimes actually for weed control or for other reasons, it, it is just necessary. And I think we need to bear in mind those range of impacts, but also the range of advantages that, that cultivation systems give us in making those decisions. And there isn't a perfect decision, so. No, thank you. So let's go on. Next slide, please. So this, um, moving on to our uh, rented block, which is uh, just to the west of Bedford. Um, we've been tenants there since 2014. Um, again, as Liz will come to in a minute, is a significantly heavier block, probably similar clay content to the first field we saw at Tyso. Um, again, rape was grown here five years ago, we've had three subsequent wheats, which have all done well, considering uh, the, the seasons we've had. Um, and then they're due to go spring beans this uh, this coming spring in 21. Uh, cultivations uh, again. I planted a cover crop here with the, with a horse sprinter around about the first week of September. Um, embarrassingly, for this from the point of view of this photo, uh, I've lost a fair chunk of the really heavy parts of the field to slugs. Um, sort of combination of focusing on drilling and trying to get to, uh, trying to get sure make make sure that's in good order the, the cover crops got left effectively um slug pelleting on other parts of the farm took precedent and as a result i i was a little bit too late for some of this next photo please so this is i've, I've moved further up the field to what was an old pasture uh old pasture historically pastoral end of the field um so again this cover crop is showing is, is spring barley uh, vetch and black oat um this part of the field I'm really pleased with. It's doing exactly what I wanted to do and try and maintain some green cover through the winter. Uh, last year where we planted um, spring beans after um, some barley volunteers, we're really pleased with the the uptake uh, and the, the the way that the drill travelled across the ground on some heavy, heavy soil. Um, so I'm really looking forward to sort of doing more of this and trialling trialing more. Next slide, please. So you can see straight away from sorry. the photograph. But before you start this one, I've just been asked, and I think we ought to do it now really, somebody's asked what the levels of um, PMN and, and CO2 burst are that, uh, that represent poor, medium and good. They are, they are currently under review in the AHDB project. So I... I, and I, off the top of my head, I don't, I don't know the numbers um, as an absolute. And then the other thing, even if, even if I could call the numbers to mind, I'd rather not. 
simply because I think by this time next year, when we come to publish them, we may have actually just changed where those boundaries are slightly. I don't think they're going to change a lot. Um, for they are, I'm just looking at the numbers I've got for luck. For they're they're in the 25s to 30 for PMN and the 60 or so for CO2 burst. But I said they they're going to um, they're under review at the moment. Thanks. So very different soil texture here compared to in general what we've seen. This is still high pH ground, um, heavy but heavy clay, and actually lower proportions of sand. And I think that's probably the key difference here, probably even in how these soils will will behave in relation to tie so close, even in the very long term. Um, more silt, which which makes them slightly trickier to manage, less ability to, to be stabilised. Though high calcium, slightly calcareous, is going to help with that structural stability. Here, I think this, this block as a whole stands out for having, and, and we'll see another soil on here in a minute, and I think the, the numbers are very similar, low phosphorus block not rick problem but a long-term management has has led to low both low phosphorus and actually despite its coloring in in green the bottom end of the green here for organic matter so we see good ability for this soil to make itself into crumbs but that's not being maintained or cycled in the same way. Very tight clay subsoil, that's not really or no evidence that that's because of compaction, but it is densely packed. And, and we, we have those commonly in the UK, those tight clay subsoils because of the way that they, the clay was laid down by glaciation. So this is probably the most typical of rich soils for the whole of arable um, Northamptonshire, They're quite a heavy clay soil, slightly calcareous on that boundary. Um, but not able to maintain its own p-index so phosphorus cycling and management becomes quite critical and actually these soils traditionally have had relatively low inputs of organic matter and so tend to be sitting not in a point at which they, that um, level is going to constrain production but just starting to potentially make those soils vulnerable or at least if we look at it the other way these soils have a high potential to capture and sequester more carbon and improve their structural properties as a result. Uh, next slide, please. Just sorry, just quickly on yeah. this current slide, sorry. Um, that So this, this block here and uh, subsequently the, the, the tenanted block um, over near Bedford, we've now been applying sewage sludge for two, two years on this block and the plan is that we're rotating the block uh, third we're applying sewage sludge to a third of the block each year. So th this block had sludge in 2019, um, and obviously it's subsequently had a wheat crop, and then it's going into beans. It will then have it again in two years' time, uh, to, or, sorry, 18 months' time, effectively. Um, and on the home farm, we're now using sewage sludge, or trying to use it biannually, effectively, trying to push our phosphates up. Um, but again, on our home farm, the RNCs are between two to three plus, so we, we are at the top end. On this on this block, on this whole farm, the, the phosphates have been inherently low. Uh, when we took it on in 2014, they were minus one to, yeah, one minus to two minus effectively. The odd pocket was maybe a two to two plus, but very, very, very small areas. Um, so we have been trying to push the phosphates up, but again, through a bag is very hard. Um, so we're trying to use more organic matter where possible, um, and I'd gladly take more if I could, but um, costs are always a limiting factor, especially on a tented farm. Next slide, please. Um, again, this is, our, this is our last field, effectively. So Hales, this is one of the fields that we saw earlier in one of my, in one of my slides uh, of wheat after beans. Um, so this is... The only photo we've got, we haven't got a photo of the day that Liz sampled. I think it was driving rain and she decided not to get her camera wet. So this effectively, um, we had a black grass problem on parts of this field uh, four years ago and we decided to go for a double spring break. So it's gone spring barley, spring beans, and this is the first year back into wheat. Um, again, Terra Star lightly tickled over the surface just to 
incorporate a few beans and break up the horn. And clay and drill and roll, again, drilled last few days of September, really good conditions, really pleased establishment. Next slide, please. So it's the same block, very similar soil type, very close match in terms of clay, sand content and colouring in, but actually quite distinctly different st structure of that topsoil um, and, and we can't be sure why, but you know, in discussion, Rick and I, the difference in the rotation most recently, probably having an impact here. Um, this is a slide I just chose to put a comment on worms. Most of the worms we've seen, particularly on this block, but actually across the farm as a whole, are mainly those topsoil dwellers, the ones that are living in the soil, responding to additions of organic matter, um, not so many of those deep burrowing worms. We might see those numbers, expect to see those numbers increase, especially on this block with increased reduction in tillage intensity. But it's, it's quite a tricky soil um, to get that right. For here, I think, um, don't forget that with low P in the soil, that doesn't necessarily mean a P limitation. So this one's even slightly lower than the last one. But getting phosphorus cycling through the organic matter um, is a really good way of keeping that out of the, the calcium lock. But in that context, it's important to not just look at the soil index, that was what we've been measuring here, but also look at actually how the, something like grain P is responding. And now RB209 has those clear guidance values in which we can use grain phosphorus as a check for whether we're able to achieve the phosphorus cycling we're expecting, coupling that with our understanding of um, the, limit, the levels of phosphorus in the soil. Good numbers of earthworms um, here, probably um, again due to a little bit more moist soil um, and those inputs of, of, of biosolids coming in. They're a tricky game, earthworms. They, they, as I say, end of J responding dominantly to organic matter additions, and dominantly if we've go, grown a good crop and we continue to be able to go good, grow good crops with as little disturbance as possible, we will see our earthworm numbers um, respond. Next slide, please. Thanks, Liz. Yeah, so this is basically uh, culminating all of the um, the fields that we've, or not all of them, sorry, but some of the uh, the main ones that we've just just gone over and, and assessed. So I wanted to show the the visual difference of soil the soils on a spade. I, I never really thought about doing this before, but Liz took a photo of all of them, sent sent them through, and it's really interesting to see them like for like side by side because even though you think you know your soils it's not until you really appreciate the the change in colors uh the size of the aggregates etc um and i just thought given the dry season we've had this year it'd be really interesting to look at a picture of the soil the organic matter content and the yield of that subsequent field um so effectively these the, on the four photos here we they all grew a wheat crop this year. Tyso Close was a third wheat, Lavender Meadow was a third wheat, Bex Ash was a third wheat, Homefield was a second wheat. So you can't say that there's one field standing out because it was um a first wheat, etc. So again, like I said, I, I want to look at Tyso Close because it's an overachieving field. In a very dry season, it's done it's done extremely well for a for a third wheat. Um and again I think it's a combination of inher inherent organic matter content heavy clay soil holding on to moisture um, but I primarily wanted to look at that field because I want to use it as a bit of a benchmark to say that's where I want to get a large amount of the farm to and I know I can't change the soil type but there's there's certain ways that we can manipulate organic matter um, and also try and um, try and get our indices as high as possible and, and I think something Liz has pointed out as well is pH I mean we do we do lime annually, probably around the farm, uh, probably every three to four years, depending on our pH levels. But again, it's very different, difficult sometimes on some of these variable soils or variable fields where you might have five soil types to try and be on top of the pH all the time. Um, again, lavender meadow, the second field, organic matter seven percent. Uh, again, which is, I'm really pleased with for a light, light land field. Uh, yield is 7.2 tonnes, which again, I'm pleased with on the year. Bex ash, a lower organic matter, but obviously it's got the higher moisture holding content with the clay. 
yielded 8.25. And then lastly, home field with all organic matter content of 4.3, which again, you'd maybe expect on a very light land like that. And again, it yielded 6.7. So pretty disappointing with that, but it, it just shows quite a nice correlation between organic matter um, and, and effectively yield, which is a representation of moisture holding capacity. Next slide, please. Rick, before you start that one, um, I yeah. just say we've, we've already overrun a bit. Uh, I, I thought we would. We're a bit over ambitious uh, in uh, doing it in an hour. Um, if, if you've got to leave, or uh, you, then th this will be recorded so you can catch it afterwards. You'll receive an email tomorrow. Um, OK, thanks, Rick. Thank you. Um, again, well, I'll just sort of run through this quickly, my my interpretation of it, um, and then Liz can cut in, I suppose. Um, so I, again, we've been through all of these scores, but it's good to see them in in the context in one in one sheet. So, as I reiterated earlier, I wanted to look at my overperforming fields and my and fields where I knew I might have issues, i.e., i.e. cottage field, which has been uh, had raising horses for twenty years, um, and I wanted to try and pull out some some items out of there. And like I said earlier, organic matter content, even though cottage field and lodge field have got some really good organic matter content, um, it's not it's not the bill on end all. The fact that the, the, the P is extremely low in cottage field at seven and also the magnesium um, effectively shows that um, that field has has lost its inherent inherent fertility despite the organic matter content. Hopefully, we can turn this round and um, get some muck incorporated in there, and I'll probably end up redrilling a, uh, another another grass uh, new lay into that. Um, but again, in terms of the arable, some of the fields which uh, I thought we had higher organic matter content, I'm slightly disappointed in in the likes of home field which. Through eight years of direct drilling, I'm disappointed that the organic matter content has not really increased significantly there. And again, Bex, Ash and Hales at the bottom, organic matter content higher than I anticipated. Um, but again, I think it's the pH and the phosphate which hold them back uh, in terms of their, their yield potential. Liz, anything to add? Yeah, so I'm just going uh, to, the, the the, given we have all these on now, the, in this organic matter, so the target the minimum sort of the is 2.7 on our light soils. So soils that are on that are, that are properly light, like home field, if it's got more than 2.7% organic matter, there's no evidence that that is holding back the function of the soil. So actually 4.3 is, is, you know, 33% higher than that. So it's, it's a good level of organic matter for that kind of soil. But in contrast, you've got 4.1 as a target once you go to your medium soils. Um, and 5.3, so these ones are only just making it on our heavy soils. So there's a long way to go for these. These guys have a lot, they're a lot closer to the risk zone in terms of impacts on function than um, our home field. So I'm I'm putting in my screen, which isn't really helping you. So sites six and seven with their 5.6 are heavy soils are, are actually, despite them making it green, are only just. And these are the kind of things where we're having a bit of a look at, at although we colour green. The information that comes with this um, GP's guidance, it's a bit like the equivalent of uh, when I walk out of that GP surgery, I get advice, well, always nearly, to eat less cake and do a bit more exercise. Um, the, the targeted advice by field here is, is slightly different. So we've, we've been able to use this GP scorecard to, to give Rick a really good sense of where his soils currently are, to identify the challenges that they have going forward, but actually, mostly to ask ourselves more questions. The other quick point I just make here as part of this, I've always asked for calcium and sodium to be measured. They're relatively easy to add to a um, where potassium and magnesium are already being measured because they're in the same extract. So they're not a costly thing to add to the analysis. I think the thing here just to notice that the typical range of calcium on soils in the UK is around a thousand to two and a half thousand. So these soils are pretty high calcium soils. The light soil, un unsurprisingly, is the lowest, but we've got those two soils where I've highlighted them with 
with quite high, significantly high calcium levels. That can be an issue in terms of if we're, and we're not on this soil, but if we were on a soil that was tending to have low potassium, for example, that very high calcium level would tend to get in the way. There's, there's a lot of it around, so the roots would be seeing a lot of calcium. That would would obstruct to some extent the uptake of um, both calcium, magnesium, and other um, cationic nutrients. I measure sodium or have sodium measured because it's a useful risk indicator for unstable soil structure. It's typically in the range 15 to 30 in the UK, so these soils are actually quite low in sodium. So no risk here in terms of high sodium causing a problem with soil structure, but perhaps um, something just to, to, to twig. I don't think we think sodium is a key issue in terms of crop nutrition, but it is the kind of thing that if we were, and Rick does have some, some livestock, looking at introducing grass or producing silage, we need to just perhaps note that that, might, that forage might actually be quite low in sodium as a consequence. Thank you, Liz. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a bit of a conclusion, effectively, to the um, the soil health check on, on the farm effectively up uh, just at a few points that I'd sort of really thought about um, before we before we took this on um, again like I said earlier I really think sometimes we often look at our poorest fields and go why is that doing what it's doing why is it underachieving and we end up soil sampling those fields trying to find trying to find reasons for its un 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 underperformance. But sometimes we don't always look at the best fields and work out why they're actually achieving as well as they are. So I wanted to try and look at some of our better fields at this, in this example and, and see where they were really, really streets ahead of the rest of the farm and then use that as a bit of a benchmark to try and push, push other underperforming parts of the farm or other parts of the farm. Um, like I said earlier, I think organic matter is not the golden egg that we all that we all think it is yes it's part of the, the whole equation and i think sometimes we just need to focus on the whole the whole nutrition uh of of that field or all that parcel in terms of magnesium p and k uh, uh as well as the organomatic content and um the one thing i've really found from using sewage sludge and uh FYM the last few years is that the the increase of biological and fungal activity in the soil is is hugely increased and I think it's got that's got a lot to answer for um, some of our soils as we've discussed are sort of quite calcareous and can be white capping and we've seen that the structures almost the, the, the surface structure has almost changed over the last three or four years from using significant amounts of organic matter um, as Liz said, I am disappointed with the number of, of, of worms in the count. Um, but again, there were significant numbers of juveniles, which, which, as Liz pointed out, is effectively saying that the soils are improving. And as long as we can maintain soil moisture and plenty of organic matter for them to eat, they're, they're, those juveniles will turn into adults. Um, in the main, I'm really pleased with organic matter contents. Uh, they've we're certainly going in the right direction. From when I started the Monster Mon Farm program, um, so we've seen some of our fields go from sort of four and a half up to just over six. Um, so I'm really pleased, we're, and we're monitoring that every every two years in the same spots, thanks to uh, Andrew Carswell at Soil. Um, again, the CO2 bursts are really pleasing, just showing some good biolog biological activity in these fields. And again, the three fields that I compared earlier, Cottage, Lodge and Lavender Meadow, tell a good story about organic matter, but also the fact that P and K need to be at a good level too. Um, in these times of extreme weather, we really need to look to increase more resilience into the system. Because I think at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's our soils that are going to see us through. Um, and I think it's, it's been at the forefront of a lot of people's minds over the last five, ten years. We really have, over the last 40, 50 years since bag down has been available, really taken the soils for granted, really. And my final point, let's hope 21 is brings some more positivity on all fronts. So uh, that is uh, that is me. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Um, thank you, Liz. Um, they were some 
your gallop through all those fields. We, we, we are, I think, into questions and answer. We've, we're already well over time. I, I think I'll make no apologies for that. It was rather interesting stuff and, and pretty important too. If we can call everybody back in for the panel for the questions. We've got loads actually, and also loads of interesting comments. That's why it would be a shame to break it up too soon. I would say, um, well, let, let's start. The, the almost difficult to know where to start. Um, going back to the, quite a lot of comment on worms um, throughout that, somebody's asked the question, was there any digestate applied? Could be a reason for low worm numbers. No, we've not had any any liquid digestate applied at all, just, just in the form of sewage sludge, so, no. They okay, aren't, thanks. They aren't atypical worm numbers for arable fields working at Rick's intensity, so they are lower than, than the targets, but they're not atypical, so you know, Rick's not being especially mean to his worms. In in general, those, those numbers aren't unexpected. Perhaps the ones that are unexpected was the low numbers on our grass fields, and I think that was actually due to the fact that those soils were still very dry at the time we were sampling them. Quite a lot of questions on cover crops. Um, I'll, I'll ask you this one first. What, what type of grassley um, was sown, uh, covering, uh, clo clover included? Sorry, and the the cover crop we we, we saw last uh, last year was a combination of um, perennial ryegrass, Italian ryegrass, and there was some clover in the mix as well. But again, being in its first its first full year and having had three silage crops off it, it's not really benefited to clover at all. So um, I'm hoping that if we could have a a fairly kind spring and a probably later first cut, it probably gives the clover a chance to establish better. Somebody's asked the question, any aphid problem drilling on the green after cover crop? Um, not as yet. I mean, that was drilled, I think, uh, it was one of my last drilling windows around about the 28th, 29th of October. So again, it's only, it's only been out of the ground for two weeks. Um, we've had a few frosts since then. Uh, it's not received insecticide yet, um, but it will it will do this week. Okay, thanks. And, uh, and another cover crop one. Um, for your cover crop of peas and barley, did you spray it off one week before drilling or how did you kill it? No, I, I sprayed it off the day before drilling because uh, I was worried about destroying the crop. Uh, or the cover too soon and then effectively not getting back to it for two to three weeks. I think if I'd had, I drilled it on the green, I was worried about drilling a dead cover crop and especially with the Claydon drill, which is, um, is, is 15 times with a leading time as well. So it would have made a mess if it wasn't rooted properly. Okay. Your rotation, Rick, is quite a reliance on winter wheat. How sustainable do you think this is? Uh, a lot of people ask this question. And I think when I first came home in 2012, we were 50-50 wheat rape. And obviously, as we all know, rape has uh, had some pretty bad, pretty hard times the last few years with, with um, cabbage and flea beetle. Um, we dropped that from the rotation three years ago and introduced spring beans and spring barley. Um, we effectively came to the conclusion that wheat is effect wheat is really the only one that actually pays it pays well um, in a good year and obviously we are 70 percent tenanted farm um, and with some difficult springs we just found that the unreliability of some of these spring crops was sometimes not sufficient to to, to take us forward to keep us moving forward so that's why we came to the conclusion that we wanted to try and introduce as much um, sewage sludge and organic matter as possible um, and in effect we're also roguing so we row black grass annually our black grass burden has got to a point where we've cut back on post m herbicides so we're, we're fairly heavy early on with pre m herbicides um, but it's got to a point where we we can grow continuous wheats in some fields um, sustainability there'll be a lot of people who will say that's not sustainable. I should be looking at having a, 
a legume in the mix or rotating grass in there, etc. But as all, as we all know, the economics of it sometimes don't always stack up, um, which is why I'm trying to bring in import as much organic matter as possible onto the farm, so we can maintain having that high level point effectively. Okay, we'll give you a rest now. I think it might be over to Liz for this one. Um, not necessarily, anyway. If a no-till, min-till grower has to plough, will an application of FYM prior to ploughing reduce the effects on soil microbes? Or is this just a feel-good exercise? <laughs> um, it's not just a feel-good exercise. Anytime you can feed the soil, it's a good thing to do, whatever cultivations you're doing. Um, will, I think... The, the, if the soil is in good heart, as in it's been managed well in its min-till, no-till phase, if the ploughing is done in good conditions, actually the ploughing will have relatively limited disruptive impact. We can all make a mess, I'd be particularly good at it, um, at, with any piece of kit. So Rick can probably make a re huge mess with a Claydon if he tries hard, probably doesn't even have to try that hard. There's nothing special about the piece of machinery. It's all actually about that combination of how that piece of machinery is used in a timely way. And so ploughing isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it is even more critical that with the more or with the more soil disturbing activities, whether that's ploughing or something like destoning or anything more extreme, that actually the soil is at the right moisture content when that's done both in the layer we're working and and below so that we're doing the best possible job very old-fashioned timeliness and husbandry are the key Do, does that is that offset by adding organic matter you're certainly not doing any harm and certainly i would discuss in other contexts of the importance of that but on a rotational basis so i think it's useful to put in organic matter when you're plowing but actually if you're already doing that really well through the rest of the rotation, you'll see the benefit of the organic matter that's already in the soil. So it's it's not necessarily that just once targeted thing, because I think part of the problem is that if the ploughing isn't in great conditions, you can end up with a slab of organic matter in one layer in a ploughed system rather than an evenly incorporated one. OK, this one's a, a comment more than a question, but you might like to comment back. Organic matter levels more to do with your rotation than direct drilling. Uh, essentially, yes. Um, again, so we, we, we the simple the simple explanation, which is relatively simple. Your organic matter level is like your bank balance. If you pay more organic matter in, you put more organic matter materials in. In general, your bank balance goes up. But it depends on what you're taking out. And tillage is one of those key things that determines how fast the organic matter is breaking down in the soil. It breaks down more the more you aerate it, the more intensively you cultivate. So that's like me suddenly I might be paying more organic matter in. But if I'm also withdrawing more money from my bank account, the organic matter won't go up. So the two things are coupled, but not related, if that makes sense. So if I don't put any more organic matter in, my soil cannot increase in organic matter. I, but I will be reducing it less, if that makes sense. But to build organic matter in the soil, I really need to be building organic matter. That can not doesn't have to be bringing in literally through biosolids or organic manures. It can also be about growing better crops. So actually, the roots and the crops and the crop residues themselves are key in that balance. I, I Somebody suggested. Just, sorry, Rick, sorry, carry on. Uh, I was just going to say to back that up. We've we've had certain parts of the farm where. Since 2012, using the Claydon drill, we've had heavy pockets of fields, which once we've got uh, the crop established, we've managed to maintain uh, good good crop cover. And effectively, by pushing those parts fairly, fairly hard at times, we've managed to firstly get a good, um, a good crop on those areas. And as a, re as a result of achieving good grain yield, we're getting high straw yield as well. So... I've been really pleased with the amount of the amount of organic matter we've returned through through just chopped straw in certain places, and I think sometimes there's a there's a element of people out there who are desperate to go down a, a direct drilling route and effectively think that's the answer to increasing organic matter. But fundamentally, you need to start with a good a good crop wall to wall across the whole field. 
to return return that chopped straw. We, we, we only we only bale now. Um, well, historically, we baled some spring barley down the floodplain, where effectively that would that floods and washes the straw away. So we're using that as my bedding for my cattle. So the rest of the farm is is 100% chopped. Very good. Somebody suggested um, for fields going into a spring crop. I wonder if adding chicory to the cover crop mix might give some meaningful root penetration into the clay subsoil. What do you think, uh, Liz? It, any deep rooter, I think the key then will be about establishment date. So I noticed Rick had his cover crops anything from the middle of August through into early September. There will be a big difference, and, and Georgina might want to comment from Anglian water data, but there's a big difference in how that well those cover crops establish even things that, that might be deep rooting based on their on their drilling and establishment though. Oh, uh, um, I think we better make these the last two questions more or less um, or three even. Some residual herbicides are not recommended above 10 percent soil or should this be regarded as... Oh we're losing you a bit there Judith, might want to repeat that sorry. I've come back. Yeah, yes. you're back now. Uh, I can read sorry it. Not about that. I don't know what happened. Some some residual herbicides are not recommended above ten percent soil organic matter. Should this route be regarded as an upper limit for soil organic matter? I guess it depends if you want to or need to use those residual herbicides. Um, I think it's very, uh, we saw from those data that those higher organic matter levels dominantly were associated with the soils in grass, where actually that's because they're in grass and, and that question then isn't quite so so linked. 9.9, um, .9, which is what we saw in TISO, um, is starting to potentially get marginal. Um, and that's about just the efficacy of some of those herbicides and their stabilization on that organic matter. So it means that that's a factor that would need to be taken account in management. Um, I, I think it's it's probably for Rick to comment on on actually whether he's taking that into account. I, I think I've seen it before um, when I managed a farm in Lincolnshire. We had some certain black black soils which were organic matter was 14 plus percent, and again. I, I agree. It's, it's a recommendation that you shouldn't be using residual herbicides in those situations, but it's it's more effect. Like Liz said about the efficacy, sometimes we found that those uh, those those preems are effectively uh, ineffective because it was the chemical was being locked up in the organic matter effectively. So it's again, it's a management thing. You sometimes you think, well, fundamentally, you probably shouldn't be doing it, but at the same time, if you can sustain a level of control. Um, but if that starts to break down and you don't actually have any any kind of control from that, then obviously you need to make make some changes. Um, I'm going to make this the last but one question. Um, is capping a problem and is there a plan to mitigate it? Uh, sorry, was that capping? Yes, soil, soil um, capping. Uh, if I'm honest, we used to have a significant issue with capping when we were when we were 100 percent power based um but since we've been using uh min till direct drilling we've we've not really seen uh seen the effect of that effectively because we've got all of the organic matter and chopped straw mixed in the surface profile we're not getting the same amount of slumping in the surface so we've had fields that historically we probably wouldn't roll if it had been ploughed and, and, and drilled into a fine seabed because we we're worried about establishment or, or actually emergence. But we're finding with the system we've currently got now that we can actually roll some of those, those capping soils because we've got the, the organic matter and the, 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 the very loose, uh, loose surface and friable surface to the top, top soil. There's so it's just that I talked about aggregate stability. That's that's part of the key. So those soils are in, in in building that aggregate stability through biological activity. But equally, as as Rick's just said, the higher proportion of of surface straw just reduces your raindrop impact as well. 
So those two factors working together tend to, to mean that those would be the mitigations that would be recommended if Rick was starting from soils that capped where he is, you wouldn't expect um, that to be a major issue. If anywhere, it's going to be more of an issue on the bunion block than it is on, on the home farm block because of the where those organic matters and the silt content on the bunion block sits. Okay, thank you. Um, there were a lot of questions. I think um, if there are any we haven't answered, um, apologies, I've tried to um, see whether we've already covered it. In many cases, I think we have. Um, there's final questions for Georgina, which is uh, very timely because she was going to come back anyway and just to add a bit on the contact details. But this question, Georgina, is Anglian Water going to have any grants or subsidies for farmers going forward to help with reducing pesticides in water? Certainly something we're, we're looking into. Um, at the moment, our focus has been um, around metaldehyde usage um, and sort of our, our core block of work has really been um, aimed at working with the farmers directly around the reservoirs. Um, but as we move forward now, we are certainly looking to uh, total pesticide levels and how we can work with farmers on that. Um, we are already doing, doing um, you know, some work around that in terms of monitoring and um, engaging with farmers on, on pesticide usage, best practice and everything else. But yes, hopefully as we go forward, there will be a lot more work in that area. Thank you. Did you want to add anything about contacting you? Yeah, definitely. Um, if you are in the in the sort of Ouse um, or Neen area, Northamptonshire and Bedfordshire, and are interested in having a bit more of a chat about any of the stuff that, that we've discussed today, um, or anything that I covered in my presentation, please do get in touch. Um, my contact details were in my presentation at the start, so I'd love to hear from you and um, yeah, have a bit more of a chat as we go forward. Thanks. Well, um, it's half an hour over. I've never run over a meeting this long uh, this, uh, for this long before, but never mind, as it's the first for, for everything. Um, the, a, a few finishing off bits and pieces. First, before I do that, I wish to give a, a, a great big thank you to, to all of our panel today, Elizabeth and Rick and uh, Georgina. I think uh, we, we've had our money's worth out of you uh, today. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. I wish to thank also Christian in the background for doing all the technical stuff and keeping an eye on, on us and moving us on and so on. Um, I forgot to mention near the start that there were some publications mentioned on the right hand side in the, the box near the chat. Do have a look, some uh, some very good stuff out there and on our, our website and see great soils if you haven't done already. Um, anyway, on to the, the few closing bits and pieces. There will be a survey um, for you to complete afterwards. Please uh, give us feedback uh, uh, to inform uh, future webinars. It is very useful, that sort of thing. And a reminder again, this webinar will be available on the AHDB YouTube channel as well. Um, I think we are ready for the next slide, please, with the details of the... Thank you. Uh, yeah, my contact details are on there. I nearly forgot that. Sorry. Yeah. Um, you can find them all over the place anyway on the website and so on. So here we are. And then on to the next bit. No, the, there are so many of them at the moment. Next week, believe it or not, we've actually got about 20. It's Agronomy Week and this is replacing the usual um, agronomy conference running from Monday to Friday, roughly four a day, something like that. So do, do tune in. And if you weren't aware already, we run regular Monitor Farm Monday webinars every Monday night. Um, it'll be between November and March. They've already started between seven and eight o'clock. Very important for this, especially on the 14th of December, Elizabeth's coming back. We have a, um, a soils webinar. So uh, do look out for that. You'll find the details on the website where you can sign up as always for all our of our webinars. Um, and, and just a final reminder, Again, if you don't receive our emails but would like to, do um, get in touch. You need to fill in a contact form. That, thank you all for your questions and comments. Really, really good. Thank you for that. And uh, thank you all. Um, we'll see you again uh, in the future. Thank you.